students. This session is debugging with class. So what we'll cover today, I'm going to give an introduction of a new feature in WMF5 Preview, which is PowerShell classes. Then I'm going to show how to author DSC resources using classes. I'm going to give a simple example and walk you through. This is probably the primary use case right now for classes in the preview. And then I'm going to go through some of the debugging enhancements that we've introduced in PowerShell v5. So PowerShell and classes, this kind of brings together two things that I really love, copters and tacos. <laughs> Taco copter, it's pure genius, love it. How long does that stay in the air? <laughs> Uh, good question. Uh, not long enough. the battery size. the weight of the If you include the heaters. Uh, design goals. I wanted to go through how we were thinking about some of the design goals for classes. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, we wanted people to be able to create user-defined types that have formal syntax and semantics that are, that are similar and familiar with other object-oriented programming languages like C Sharp and Java. Um, if you think about, <coughs> Kenneth likes to talk about PowerShell uh, as being more like an AK-47 than an M16. An AK-47 is sloppy, but it gets the job done. An M16 is more of a precision piece of hardware um, that kind of needs ideal circumstances to work. So. Um, most of the time, the, the AK-47 approach works great, you know. Uh, IT needs to get the job done, but there are cases where those formal semantics and, and syntax can really be helpful, <coughs> especially on the development side. Um, so that kind of gets to the next point, which is enable developers and IT pros to embrace PowerShell for a wider range of use cases. You know, Jeffrey talks about the PowerShell language as having a really broad, dynamic range this scales all the way from IT Pro to development and system programming type of tasks. Um, I think we've done a really good job of filling in the IT Pro side of the language, and Classes is kind of a, uh, an attempt to start to fill in uh, more on the development side. Uh, the next goal we had was to s really simplify development of PowerShell artifacts, and with a particular focus in V5 around DSC resources, <laughs> making that easier and so that you don't have to learn MOF, for example, to, in order to implement a DSC resource, and just making that a whole lot uh, easier and more productive. And then all of this together, we hope, will accelerate coverage of management services in Windows and make things uh, much more manageable through PowerShell. In terms of the scenarios that we wanted to support, uh, first of all, being able to define custom types as PowerShell classes. The second was being able to define DSC resources as a class and then their associated types, if there are other uh, types that you need to define that go into that, being able to define those as well. Supporting properties and methods as part of a class, being able to debug those types in the PowerShell debugger, and then being able to handle exceptions using more formal mechanisms than we have today. Those scenarios kind of break down into a set of features that we focused on. So right now, there's some things that are implemented in the V5 preview, but you should think about this as sort of a journey. We're just getting started on the journey. Um, there's some things that are working. There's a lot of stuff that isn't working. It doesn't necessarily mean that we won't support it or that uh, it'll be like that forever. We're continuously kind of on this cycle to, to improve things that are more rapid cadence and get bits out to you more frequently. So you should expect that um, that uh, this isn't a fully baked thing and that we're going to continue to improve it over time. In the, in the V5 preview, we have support for the class keyword. We have support for properties and for methods. You can also define enums. We have support for the static keyword. You can define constructors, including um, overloaded constructors. Uh, we have support for overloads on methods as well. Um, you can, in the preview, you can use existing attributes but uh, you can't define new attributes yet. Uh, obviously, there's support for lexical scoping, which I'll be going into, and so some special support for defining certain aspects of DSC resources. Some things that we're thinking about that aren't in there yet, I'm not going to comment on time frame, but these are just some of the things that we know we'd like to do eventually. Uh, inheritance is a big one. 
Um, we're, we've been talking a lot about visibility, you know, <coughs> public versus private, those types of things. Um, we've talked about how to support read-only members. Um, we've talked a lot about namespaces and how to expose those in the right way. Um, that also kind of ties in with the using keyword. We introduced the using keyword, uh, I think, in V4, but then expanding on the use cases for, for using um, is something we've been thinking about a lot. Uh, being able to implement an interface in the PowerShell language is something we've, we're thinking about. Also, of course, defining your own custom attributes in PowerShell. Um, right now, when you go to instantiate a class, you need to call, uh, use the double colon syntax and call the new, uh, new method there. And I'll show you how that looks like. So we don't have support right now for new object, but that's something we want to support eventually. And also in the preview, there's a, a limitation around return types uh, that you can't return collections right now. So, uh, so we're looking at fixing that. And then we, there's some other things that people have asked for that we've talked about. We don't have any immediate plans for these things, but they are, at least we've thought about them and have them in our list. Uh, that includes mix-ins, generics, expandos, and nested types. We don't have any um, really strong scenarios for those at this point, but um, as we go along and if we find that those things are going to be useful and, and we need to enable those, we will definitely uh, investigate doing that. And with that, let me jump into a demo for classes. So this is a machine that has the September preview on it. There's also one thing I should mention is that um, there's some issues in the September preview that make uh, using classes in the ISC problematic. And so I'll be authoring some stuff in the ISC, but I'm going to probably jump back, back and forth between the ISC and the console host quite a bit to to make stuff work. So let's just start out and define a simple class. Let me zoom in a little bit here. So we got a foo class here. And constructors should have the same name as their class. So this is similar to uh, C sharp. So you say foo parentheses. That's how you define a constructor. And constructors can have overloads, as I mentioned. So you could say foo like this. Maybe this one takes an int. I can define another one here that takes an array of ints and a string, let's say. OK. So this is very basic uh, class definition. Go ahead and flip over to the console host. Oh, let me fix my properties here. Let's see. All right. Just paste that in there. And then you can instantiate using the new method. So you would say, for example, foo new. There you go. Instantiated a class. Uh, let's try the other constructors. There's one for the int. Of course, I'm not using those right now, so those all look the same. Let's try the other one here. And takes an array. There you go. Um, so that's that's what it looks like for instantiation right now. And uh, eventually, we want to support the new object. But yeah, question. I was just wondering, is there uh, any reason? Oh, I don't know how how you implemented it, but is there any reason why one couldn't just use you have an add type right with mm -hmm. uh, where you can actually pass in code, and which will be compiled depending on if you what language you mm -hmm. pick. There, all those things you talked about, yeah. inheritance, collection, just yeah. blah, 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 you name it. Uh, is there any reason why one couldn't just take this and have a, a new like language parser uh, or a compiler basically could be do the same with the power, this PowerShell this mm -hmm. class language and then you would get everything for free? Yeah, the question is, is uh, why not just use add type here and then pass in the class definition? 
So the idea is being able to, um, we don't have, being able to just define it in line like that with the PowerShell language, and then we'll compile it uh, on the fly, and so you don't even have to have add type or call add type. Yeah, Jim, you want to? I think the bigger one is, the bigger reason is the, the actual scripting of the methods and whatnot is, power, can be, is PowerShell script huh? versus C sharp. Yep. So it's more, of, it's more of an approach. I mean, it's just a different language, right? But it's, I yes, mean, exactly. you just need a different compiler, and, but it'll all be, I, I mean, I guess I'm, that's how I would think of it. It's just oh. sort of like you have these uh, machine uh, language, right? Um, so you have, uh, just like you had with the with configuration, sure. you're sort of mimicking, you have this own, your own keywords there, uh, have something similar here, and then just pass that into a uh, compiler for, okay, anyway, I just, it was just, a, I was just wondering, uh, yeah, how this was implemented, and if that's, if there was thought around implementing that way. Well, so these are real .NET types. Yeah. So .NET supports everything that we hope to get to in the future. There's a lot of work to go from the PowerShell language to the point where we can represent it as a .NET type. And so how do we represent to users what inheritance looks like? And how does that feel for somebody who's really familiar with PowerShell? And so just going through that path, that's going to take a while for us to get there. Okay, because I just see so many similarities between C Sharp and, and PowerShell. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can pretty much write a, a parser that will convert C Sharp into PowerShell, and you even have like things like the command delimiter, uh, mm -hmm. which you can leave alone, and you know just turn new into new object. And yeah. Blah blah blah. Yeah, it's not. I don't know so that we've. Maybe it's not that easy. Right? It's just it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an inter interesting conversation, though. Um, all right, so that's instantiation. Let me show you another example here, which is uh, properties. So let's define a class, hotel, let's say. And let's go through some property declaration. So you just call out the type, which actually is optional and then dollar for your the name of the item <coughs> booked um, also properties can have initializers so for example string name let's say park hotel let's add the phone number in there Anyone knows the phone number? Happen to have it. And also, as I mentioned, static is supported. <coughs> so you can say, you can have a static member. Let's say reservation count. And initialize that as well. However, the type is optional. So I can just have dollar D here. So let's go ahead and run that. Okay. And um, key thing to note is that all members right now are public by default. So let's instantiate this guy and just pipe it. Uh, uh, let's see. I don't know why that's happening. Just exit that. There we go. Some strange things. Uh, yeah, so you can see all the members are public by default here. We don't have support yet for um, access modifiers, and we're still thinking through what that what that looks like exactly. All right, let's close that guy. Now let's talk a little bit about methods. So let me add my hotel class back in here. Methods. So first of all, all methods are public by default. Public. 
So you start out with the return type here. Let's choose bo void. Make a book it method. This keyword works to reference the instance. Let's increment our reservation count. The other thing you can do is you can run commandlets in here in line. So for example, here I'm just going to run get date. Copy this in, see if this works. <clears throat> Not going to work. Let me close the ISC. These are get rid of the blank lines. Okay. Try that. That worked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lee. So let's try meth uh, method invocation here. So. By the way, this gets much more stable like two weeks after the September. <laughs> yeah. so, it's caught us at an interesting time for sure. So method invocation looks just like it does in you know when you're invoking any other uh, method on any other class. So there you go, um, and method overloads are also supported. So let's see if I can go back in the IC here to give you some syntax highlighting. Method overloads are supported. So let's make another one here. Scroll up. We'll add another one here for date. Let's just copy this over. And here. We'll use that guy. Close the ISC. See if that makes a difference. There we go. So get our instance here. And like in V4, if you leave off the parentheses, then you can get a list of the overload definitions. And you can just call whichever ones you need. All right. So that's a rundown of properties and methods. Now let's talk about return types. So with return types, the return type is a contract and it will be converted uh, either implicitly or explicitly will be converted to the expected type. So let's define another class here, count. Int uh, increment it's going to give me these squigglies until I give a return um, the other thing to note is that there's no streaming of objects and uh, you can't write objects either implicitly or explicitly to the pipeline so that's a key difference that, that you want to be aware of when you're writing a class, that you have to use the return keyword to return, return what you want. Um, so for example, if I have something in here incrementing the input, blah, 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 this is not returned. There's no streaming of objects back. You need to say return <coughs> like this, OK? Um, Let's see if we can run this one. Yeah, while you're on that, why was that actually, why is, was it implemented that it, that it stream objects in, in PowerShell? Because I know a lot of C-sharp programmers get really 
blown away when they see that, and then uh, that's a very typical bug or hard to find bug where you have yep. if they're calling a method or something they don't realize that there's a return value, and all of a sudden their ret return set is different. What, yeah. What was the uh, what was that decision made? It was really just this uh, uh, starting with the kind of interactive shell semantics, mm -hmm. and then as we added incremental sort of developery things, you know, the return statement um, was like this false promise. You know, in fact, we had shell semantics. Anytime you emitted something, it went to the output, and return did that as well. So it was really just sort of those sort of. So what is best? Pr I mean, I, best practice for me is if you don't, you either eat the eat the object with a void or out null or assign it to a variable. Yeah, she used classes. Then explicitly use for return. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we did classes. Yeah. It's one of the big reasons why we you're going to okay. love classes. Yeah. Oh wait, so the other. Other streams are still there, you know, for Bose, error. It's just the object stream is gone yeah. and replaced with return. So just to repeat for the recording, so the question was why did we even have the, the streaming of objects semantics to begin with? Uh, and, and the reason is, as Jeffrey explained, we wanted to have shell semantics in, in PowerShell uh, by default so that you had that, expect that was the user expectation, but it does make it challenging in, in these types of scenarios. So for these types of scenarios, that's why we have classes to, to get those other semantics. So here I've got my class count, and let's go ahead and instantiate that and invoke a method here. This is a static method. Okay, this is an error you'll see a lot <laughs> in the September preview. Uh, Let's try again. Okay. This is consistent. This is consistent. <laughs> well, sometimes it is. <laughs> okay. What I, what I wanted to show here is, um, so here we're we're passing an integer in to the method, uh, forty seven and we're incrementing and returning it. But uh, if you were to pass an, another type like a double in, uh, then the return type, because the return type up here is, is int, it would be implicitly converted to an int, uh, even though what you passed in or what you were returning was a double. And that's, uh, that's by design for that uh, with return types. If you passed in a string one, you'd get back 11, right? <laughs> string one? Uh, yeah, is that what it gets converted to? Well, yeah, because you, you, you add one to it. You add one to a string, it's a string, that's 11, but then you cast it as an integer. So types are your friend. So in the method, you would have said int i, <coughs> that, that wouldn't have happened. Were you uh, introducing a strict uh, type well, typing at any point? Or an option to turn on strict? What do you want with strict? What, I, that all the types are, are have to be declared? Yeah, it's a good idea. I mean, just, it's nice. To, to know because the, the magic of the conversion is sometimes a little baffling. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, strings are, are great. You don't have to worry about objects, but then the real power of the PowerShell is the object. And a lot of, I guess, IT pros don't they don't know about the objects. They just use strings all the time, yeah. which magically get converted into who knows what. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is is whether we would have some sort of strict mode. Yeah, yeah. The rules of GM is to control the conversion. Yeah, we've definitely thought about about you know how strict mode uh, works with classes, so that's still being defined, but uh, it's definitely something we've talked about. I mean, of course, you can take control and type everything, right? Right. All right. Next thing I want to talk about is is lexical scoping, which is a key a key thing for classes to get your head around. So the example here, let's say I uh, have a script that goes in and uh, defines a variable, initializes it. This is going to be in script scope. Now let's go and define a function. And let's have the same variable and initialize it to something else. This is going to be function scope. And then let's define our own class here and call a do something method on it.
Now let's go define our class down here. We'll have a static method here that does something. And we're going to return $D. So what is this going to do? So, so think about this for a second. What, what's going to happen when you call a uh, function bar in the shell? What, what do you think is going to happen here? Uh, what's it going to return? Is the order in which it's defined working here anymore? Or do you have to define my class before? That's a good question. Is the order important? Um, is it going to return zero, do you think? Because zero gets set in function bar before it calls do something. Or is it going to find this this uh, script scope up here, dollar uh, D, or is it going to do something else? So let's see what this does. <laughs> it's going to return an error. So <clears throat> this is a key aspect of lexical scoping. So the error tells you exactly what the problem is. Variable must be must be a property of the class or assigned in the method. So if you look back here, dollar D isn't defined anywhere in lexically within the class. And so whereas dynamic scoping, it would go and it would find, find where D is defined. With lexical scoping, that's not the case. So that's a key difference here. Um, let me show you another example. Suppose we change this to script dollar D. Now, now what do you think it's going to do? Squiggly's gone. Squiggly's gone. You have using as well? Uh, I don't think that works yet. So let's see what this is going to do. Well, compiled, so that's a good sign. So let's call bar. Okay, no error yet. Equals dollar D. It's 42. So that did grab the script scope, brought it in brought it in and uh, and that's what you end up returning there. Let's take a look at another example. Let me close this. Um, let me delete this. Suppose we grab dollar D, we redefine it here, grab the script scope D, and then return R D. Think that's going to work? That's going to work because it is found lexically. We're defining it here. We're grabbing the value from the from the script scope D, and we're bringing it into into scope here. So that's another way to do it. Okay. So this is really important. Uh, if you're not familiar with lexical scoping. It's a big difference between how you, how you use PowerShell today, which has dynamic scoping. So it's something you're going to want to get your head around. Uh, let me give you a counterexample. Lexical scoping, a counterexample. So um, actually, I'm just going to do this in the console here. Suppose you have a function as returns dollar j what do you think this is going to do when you when you run it so first of all no compilation errors uh, there's no compilation happening here there's no issue you call it dollar j isn't defined anywhere and so it's null so it just returns and nothing happens now if we set dollar j here in our session now we have dollar j defined so if we call baz dynamic scoping goes and finds dollar j defined even though it wasn't uh, defined within the within the function body itself dynamic scoping goes and looks up and it finds dollar j and then returns it so that's the difference uh, in how PowerShell works with dynamic scoping today versus lexical scoping which is uh, what we have in classes All right. <coughs> Next example I want to show is enums. So um, 
Support for the enum keyword has been added. Now, technically, this is a breaking change because we <coughs> didn't reserve that keyword in previous versions. Um, so if you happen to be using that, um, there is a workaround, which is to use the call operator, the ampersand, before, before your enum. Uh, and then that will that will work. Otherwise, so uh, we think most people probably aren't going to be affected by that. I just wanted to let you know. Um, so you s use the enum keyword, say my color, and then you can start to find new values. And the current uh, delimiter for enums is uh, a new line. So here you got some values. There's another limitation to call out, which is that um, you can't specify like a custom base type for the enum. It's always int. Um, you also can't define an enum in terms of itself. Um, but you can initialize uh, an enum value in terms of another enum. So for example, um, let's take this one. Maybe I want to use color from .NET. So that'll work. Um, let me go through another example. My ordinal. First, um, so the en enum values ha uh, must be a parse time constant. You can't, uh, but you you can't set it to the result of an invoked command. So, for example, you can say you know first equals get date or something like that. But you could set it to um, a constant like that. You can also do something like this, because that would be a, um, a constant value. Let me go through another example here. Uh, let's see. Enums do support arithmetic operations. So for example, you can define min in this one, let's say, and maybe I'm using the other enum I just defined. Take the second value and add one to it. Max, I'm going to define it as in terms of the other enum, third minus one. So, so there is some flexibility there in terms of uh, defining your, value, your values and, and initializing them. But there's also some caveats to be aware of. I don't have the type loaded. Yep. Is All the right. default zero and then increment by one? Is the default zero and then increment by one? Uh, like in your case with the color, uh, my color. That's a good question. Is it zero and then uh, zero, one, two, three? Yes, or yes. One. The default, yes, the first value is, is zero. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's get back to slides. All right, the other demo I want to go through is um, an example that's in the release notes in the preview. Um, this is using classes to implement an HTML DSL. Let me show you what this looks like. So I've got this in here. So this is a cool example that Bruce put together um, that, that shows how you can use classes to implement a fairly simple DSL for HTML. So the way this works, there are a few classes <laughs> defined um, that describe the structure of, of an HTML document. So you've got kind of the top level class is the HTML class. It has members, it has a, a doc type, it has a head and a body. The head is, a, is a, an, another custom class, which is HTML head and body is a an element class that we're defined later. And then there's a method called render, which basically takes those properties and builds out the HTML for, for a head and for a body, and then returns it all as a single string. And then there's also a, a two-string method here that's defined uh, to get the string representation, which just calls the, the render method. So in terms of the head class, it's pretty simple. There's the set of properties, title, base, link style, etc and builds out the HTML required and returns that. The element class has uh, a tag member, a text member, and then attributes. 
And here uh, in the render, we, we take the attributes and we, we iterate over them and we, um, we build out the HTML um, notation for the attributes. There's also a set of functions that we define in here that are helper functions, uh, make it easy to export this from the module and use those functions uh, to, to generate the HTML and call into those classes for things like uh, the, the heading, the paragraphs, uh, bold text, italics. Um, there's a function here for defining an anchor tag and you get the name and the link. It uses the element class to compose the tag and then returns that. There's also a helper function here to build out a table. It takes the table data, takes the properties for the table and the attributes which kind of define the look of the table. It goes through and adds in the header rows and then iterates through each of the rows defined and, and uh, calls into a couple other helper functions, uh, tr and td, to build out the, the row and data, the uh, pieces of the table. And then it brings everything together and returns the table. These are the helper functions for the header and the row pieces. And then there's also a function here, style, which will um, allow you to define a set of CSS styles and add those to your document. And then this last function here um, casts the document uh, to an HTML document and then returns that back. And then I wanted to show an example of how this <coughs> gets used, which is pretty cool. So this script is just going to import the module. It's going to define uh, some CSS styles here as a single string. So we've got our body, we've got our, some headings here, we've got uh, a bigger font size, paragraph, and a table styles. <coughs> um, here we're using just defining a variable and using it in, in our HTML. And then here's where we start to use the DSL to build out the HTML document. So we set the doc type, we add in the head, and uh, it's very simple syntax. Makes it really concise and fluid, as you can see, uh, easy to read. Body goes through and we're going to define, uh, we're going to set our styles right here. And then define a heading, define some paragraph text, can invoke a commandlet here, can insert a blank section, add some more ipsum in there just for the fun of it, uh, add a link. <coughs> Then we're going to show some dynamic content here. We're going to use um, heading two and build out a table of processes. And then we're going to build out another table of event log data. And then close with another heading. So that's our HTML. And then we're going to call the render method on that. And then output that to an HTML file and start it up. So let me go to demos. Let's run our example script. And here's our HTML web page. There's our heading, our code. <laughs> so our links, our tables. And if you take a look, this is pretty interesting. This is about 60, 70 lines of code, and we generated, you know, 400 something lines of code, HTML. So it's pretty handy, and I really like how it, how fluid and nice the DSL gives. It's, you know, the, the syntax is very easy to read as a result of that. Okay. All right, let's get back to DSC resources. So there's a few things to keep in mind when authoring DSC resources using classes. So um, first of all, you don't need a MOF file. Yay, that's a good thing. That's the whole point. Uh, you don't need a DSC resources subfolder in the module folder. You can just define it in like a PSM1. Um, a single module can define multiple DSC resources. You don't need them separate. Um, and you also have to have a key property, and that's the same as when you define it in MOF. We are introducing three new attributes as part of classes that help with defining DSC resources. The first is uh, DSC resource attribute. This tells 
uh, tells the engine that uh, this class is a DSC resource. There's DSC resource key attribute. So that's how in, in Moth, how you say key, that's uh, for the for specific key properties. This is the attribute that you use for that. And then for mandatory attributes, we have a DSC, man uh, DSC resource mandatory attribute that you can use. And then the other thing, of course, you want to define your three methods, get, set, and test, <laughs> and uh, make sure that those work. All right, with that, let me go into the demo. Close some stuff. All right. <clears throat> so the first thing we want to do is make a module for storing our DSC resource. And a key thing, make sure that you put it into program files directory, which was something that I was not doing correctly early on. The reason why is that the LCM runs under local system account, so it'll be looking for modules here. If you put them like in your own custom directory and you don't update PS module path, or you put them in the user's location, it's not going to be able to find them. All right, let's make a couple files here. Let's go and edit those in the ISC. And let's build out our DSC resource. So let's start with an enum called ensure, which is something that you'll probably use a lot. Absent, present. Now let's add in our, our keyword, uh, DSC resource, our attribute, I should say. File resource. I'm just going to build a simple example of copying a file. Got to define a key. It's a string. It's the path is the key. Use my ensure enum here. I'm going to define another property that is mandatory, which is source path. I need to know where the file is. Now I'm going to build out my set method. So the first thing I'm going to do is check if, if ensure is present. Then what I want to do is see if the file is there. And if it's not, I'm going to copy it there from the source path to the path. Otherwise, <clears throat> that means we don't want it there. And so we're going to remove it. All right, that's my set method. Now let's implement get return file resource. We're just going to get get the item at the specified path and return it. <coughs> and then <coughs> last one, we need to implement our test method. So here, check again to see what ensure is set to. If it's set to present, then we're going to turn the results of test path. Else, we're going to return the opposite. There you go. All right, so that's our that's a very simple DSC resource that just uh, copies a file built using classes. Um, all right, got that guy. Now let's go and grab our file, the PSD one. Let's 
build out our module manifest here. Oops. Give it a module version. Give it a GUID. Oh man, I need to give it a GUID. <coughs> There we go. Give it PowerShell version. I don't think you need this, but put it in there. And then define our root module. All right. So let's close those guys. And let's see. Close everything here. Now we want to define a little script that's going to use our new our new conf uh, resource. So let's define uh, file config and let's edit that guy. So we're going to say configuration <coughs> um, PS profile, let's say. This is one that I picked because I know <coughs> the profile, example profile is always there. We're going to call import DSC resource and we're going to say module file and use it here file resource file path is going to be quotes dollar home documents uh, windows powershell just copy it into here profile the ps1 and source path is at ps home examples Profile of PS1 and ensure that it's present. So that's our configuration, and of course, we need to invoke it. I'm going to do it verbose so you can see it. Yeah. yeah. Is uh, dollar home going to be properly evaluated? DSC is going to run in the system context. Yeah, but I'm doing this all in one machine, so of course it's going to work. <laughs> Um, no, that's a good good point. Uh, I probably would have to use using here or or um, let's see is on the on the target machine. Dollar Home should be evaluated. I mean, yeah, it should. Dollar Home should. The question is whether Dollar Home would be evaluated. I think it should be evaluated here because um, because of it's in the quoted string. All right, let's try it. Um, file config, we'll run it. Oh, one thing. Before we run it, I do want to show, see if it's there. Not there yet. All right. Now let's invoke our file config. There we go. We have our uh, configuration now, produce the MOF. So now we can run our configuration with start DSC configuration, specify the path, computer name, local host, wait. Um, let's see. Oh, I, what I want is not that. Cool. All right, and let's just double check with our test. Test says it was true. Let's check. And there it is. All right, so that's a simple example of um, authoring a DSC resource using classes. And I'm about out of time. But I did want to um, give you a quick, really quick rundown of the debugger enhancements. Okay, yeah. The, the big benefit of using classes for DSC is if you don't get it right the first time, you can just go add a property, and it's so much simpler to do than using the modules in the mod file. It's really simple to iterate. That's yep. the huge benefit. Yep. Debugging enhancements in V5. I'm, just, I'm not going to do any more demo. Just two things. Um, 
we have remote script debugging, we have workflow debugging, we have break all into a running script. So when the script's running, you can hit control break and it'll break into the script. Um, we have PowerShell <coughs> job debugging and a really brand new feature which is attached to process script debugging, which is exposed through a couple new commandlets. Um, just real quick on each of these, remote script debugging. So this is a, the experience is really similar to local debugging. And key thing, it works not only in the console host, but also in the IEC. So if you have a remote tab open, um, you, can, you can debug that script remotely, which is really cool. Um, you can debug in, a, in an interactive remote session with Enter PS Session. And you can also debug in a one-to-many scenario where you, where you invoke command a script across a lot of machines and then, and then uh, break into the debugger on one specific machine. Uh, in terms of workflow debugging, so we have uh, workflow function debugging that's now integrated with the script debugger. And we do support uh, line breaks with the action parameter, if you're familiar with that, it lets you run an action uh, on a specific breakpoint. And it does the actual workflow XAML debugging, which we didn't have in the past. Um, and you can do that across multiple machines. Uh, break all into a running script. So this will, whatever the script is doing at the moment, it will suspend the script and then it breaks into the debugger at whatever point it is currently executing. And that's done with control break. Um, you can also, if you're in the ISC, you can hit break all or control B is the key, is the key to press there. And that works for not only local but also remote scripts, which is really cool. Um, remote job PowerShell uh, job debugging. So this works with background, remote, or workflow jobs. And it takes the asynchronous job and it turns it into an interactive synchronous script execution that is running inside the debugger. And you can, uh, you can quit, once you're in the debugger, you can quit running the job if you want, or just detach the debugger and, and let the job continue. And this also works remotely as well. And then attached to process debugging, we have two new commandlets that we've introduced. Enter PS host process and exit PS host process. So you can get a list of the run spaces and you can, uh, the processes that have PowerShell loaded and you can uh, attach the debugger to one of those processes and then break into the debugger and start looking at what's happening there. And uh, you can do that um, interactively on a local host process as well as uh, remote. And uh, I was gonna go into a demo, but I'm out of time. So if you're interested in those, I can show you <coughs> later. That's all I got. Uh, okay.